Yeah, I, I want to I want to emphasize that that I'm I'm trying to invite audience interaction. I just want to make sure that that I that I don't uh, you know um, run out of time to give the whole presentation. But please do interrupt during the talk with questions and discussion, and only if we're starting to you know hit get close to the limit do we need to be at all concerned about uh, scarcity of time. Are yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I have a mic. Oh, do we have an audience microphone? No. Um, I, I, yeah, for the for the room. Oh, um, okay. I'm getting. Okay, we're, I'm using a microphone. Okay. If you if if there's any question about whether I'm loud enough, the the microphone is the right thing to do. Yes. Let's not worry about it. Uh, if, some, if somebody has something to say, you know, please interrupt. I would really like to stimulate a discussion. Uh, you know, this this whole talk is intended to be uh, provocative, more more than a set of worked out ideas to just present. All right. I've known Mark Miller since uh, the time when AI people were the programming language designers of the world. So that's why AI, which is related to this conference, but he has been over the years. He's currently the, the Google's representative for the ECMAScript uh, uh, standards. Uh, a, a Google representative. A, a Google representative. And you can come and talk to me to find out the surprising names of the writers of the first ECMAScript okay. uh, He's designed a bunch of languages. Uh, he's working on new languages now. Uh, he's a very deep thinker. Uh, and when I saw this topic, I decided to get here early and, and run the session. And his collaborator is Bill Pella, uh, who's kind of the economics guy. Yeah, about 30 years now, right? Yeah. yeah. So I don't want to do any more talking because I want to hear the talk. So let's, uh, let's welcome the speakers. OK. Um, I'm here to tell you today about what we have come to call the elements of decision alignment. This is an interdisciplinary collaboration where I come from computer science but with a longstanding interest in economics. And Bill comes from economics with a long-standing interest in computer science. We motivate the whole talk with this simple question. When one object makes a request of another object, why do we expect the second object's behavior to satisfy the first object's wishes? We're not the only field in which such questions are relevant. Many complex systems can be characterized as networks of entities making requests of other entities, not just object-oriented programs, but also human organizations and human economies. We stand on a long tradition of computer science borrowing ideas from economics. In object-oriented software construction, Bertrand Meyer wrote, like an economist, we are interested in individual agents, not so much for what they are internally as for what they have to offer each other. Much of object-oriented design is indeed design by contract. And as we know, the resulting design by contract ideas had tremendous influence on our field. Any such interdisciplinary investigation is an orthogonal cut through the world. It must touch lightly on many topics that are investigated deeply by, by their respective disciplines. So the price of this is oversimplification. Beware. First part of the talk, we're going to discuss the making of requests. Then how the entities involved align their decisions with each other. And then the trade-offs that they face in bringing about this alignment. 
and then we're going to revisit all of this from the perspective of the division and and division and composition of knowledge in networks of such request making entities a familiar example of one object making a request of another is a parser asking a stack to push a token in the economy, a familiar example might be, I walk up to a package delivery service and I say, um, and I ask them to deliver this gift to my dad. In economics, the term for the entity making the request is the principal. The term for the entity responding to the request, with apologies to the previous talk, the term in economics for the entity responding to the request is the agent. And I'll be using the economic terminology during this talk. When both principal and agent are humans, these relationships are studied by economics. What we wish to do, ah, hold on. Sorry about this. Okay. Good. What we wish to do is not simply borrow ideas from economics into computer science. Rather, we need to recognize that we're already in a world of mixed networks of request making, where humans make requests of objects through user interfaces, objects make requests of other objects, and objects make requests of humans. Think workflow systems or the user interface seen by an Uber driver. These networks shift and change rapidly over time, and which roles in these networks are filled by human or object changes and shifts over time, so we need to find ways to reason about these networks that transcend the differences between humans and objects. Later in the talk, I'll explain this six-step process in a loop, which is the means by which the agents align their decisions with each other. I'll be walking through a concrete example of how this perspective has helped me make trade-offs in the proposals that I've made to the ECMAScript committee that have shaped the, um, uh, the modern JavaScript language. And I'll be making some observations about the patterns that we've noticed in doing this work where the, uh, and the contrasts between these patterns that cut across the differences between humans and objects, such as the difference between mostly hierarchical networks uh, versus very decentralized networks of request making. But first, some definitions. Again, the principal is the one making the requests. The agent is the one responding to the request. The term incentive alignment in economics is when a principal or agent implicitly assumed to be human, uses incentives to induce the other's intentions to align with their own. And by align, we simply mean to compose well without interference. We coined the term decision alignment by contrast, uh, as a generalization rather, from incentive alignment. Decision alignment is when a principal or agent uses various tools to make it more likely for the other's decisions and actions to align with their own. So the contrast here are we drop the implicit assumption of humans, we de-emphasize incentives and just continue, consider it to be one of several tools to be brought to bear on the problem, and we care what the entities involved 
actually do. We don't much care whether that's what they intended to do. In economics, it's considered important to look at these relationships from the principal's perspective and the agent's perspective symmetrically. And we agree that that's important. But for purposes of this talk, we'll be taking the principal's perspective. We'll be examining uh, how the principal can use various tools to help shape the agent's behavior to align with the principal's desires. Computer science teaches us the benefits of information hiding, where principal and agent can, form, can be different specialists that, that embody different specialized knowledge. Only the principal needs to understand why he's making the request. Only the agent has to understand how, what the means are by which he's satisfying the request. Um, the, burden of knowledge that they share uh, can be minimized by a well-crafted interface to only the set of concepts that they need to share in order for the request to be meaningful to both sides. And by minimizing that burden, you also minimize the propagation of cascading changes when one side or the other needs to be changed. Economics, in looking at the same relationships, focuses on the hidden information hazards and the hidden information hazards can be divided into three parts. Uh, before the request is made, there's the, there's the principal's worry, can the agent actually do what I'll be asking the agent to do? Um, then will the agent try to do what I'm asking it to do? And then once the request is made and the agent is reacting, well, is the agent doing what I want it to do? So in the prephase, the hidden information hazard is hidden characteristics, things that the principal does not know about the agent. In the post phase, the hidden information ha hazard is hidden actions, things that the principal might not know about what the agent is doing or has done. In economics, the focus is on intentional misbehavior. So these hazards create very specific issues that the economics literature focuses on. Computer science is more often concerned with accidental misbehavior, which is to say bugs. So the particular hazards that arise from these, from these uh, hidden, hidden information problems are different, but the overall framework of analysis continues to apply, continues to fit very well, in fact. We can divide each of these phases into the following steps. In the pre-phase, the principal selects an agent, might inspect the agent, to determine what the agent is able to do and what the limits are in his abilities. Then the request contains three components. It allows the agent some range of action so the agent is able to satisfy the request. It explains to the agent what it, wa what it is that the principal wants it to do. And then it arranges to reward the agent if it does that. And then in the post phase, monitoring various kinds of instrumentation or watching activity can determine what the agent is doing or has done. And the feedback from the monitoring gets fed back into the selection process to guide the selection of this and other principles. To emphasize the steps and that they occur in a loop, we just rearrange the diagram as follows. The order here is somewhat arbitrary. Pre comes before request, comes before post. But the order of steps within those phases will differ from case to case.
so economics started with a focus on incentive alignment and a focus implicitly on the human world as the topic to account for this aligning of, of principle and agent behavior they extended to take a look at the whole set of tools that addressed, it, addressed all these hidden information hazards and how the principle can, can use them jointly um, uh, to sh help shape the agent's behavior to satisfy the towards satisfying the principle's needs. And what we're doing is generalizing this uh, to apply to the world of objects as well as to apply to the world of humans uh, by recognizing what we've, many of the techniques that we've already, that we're already familiar with in computer science, rephrasing them in this framework and, and making use of some common analysis. Oh, and um, uh, in so doing, we de-emphasize incentives as special and consider it to just one of, of several tools to be applied jointly. So let's talk about the package delivery example. When I want to have a package delivered, I first need to select a package delivery service. Um, I do this based on reputation and fit. Is this one that I've heard of before? And uh, does it have the services I need? If my dad's birthday is tomorrow, uh, maybe I need to find one that offers overnight delivery. Inspect isn't really relevant in this scenario, so we're going to skip directly to allow. In order to enable the package delivery service to do what I'm asking it to do, I actually hand over the package. And then I explain what I want them to do, um, uh, what address to deliver it to, any other delivery instructions. And I, I pay them providing them an incentive to follow through. At this point, they have the package. It's literally out of my hands. Am I left only being able to hope and pray? Well, no. There's monitoring of various sorts. They might offer tracking or return receipts. And in any case, I can ask my dad if he got it and if it was damaged. And all the information that results from um, uh, how, from what I know of how that delivery went, gets fed back to guide the selection decisions of myself and other agents, other principals rather. Okay, in order to apply this framework to the world of software, we must first divide, um, divide it into two categories. There's the static world of design and development time and there's the dynamic world of runtime. In the static world, the principles and agents of interest are developers and code. In the dynamic world of runtime, um, the principles and agents of interest are objects calling other objects. At runtime, incentives are typically not relevant Objects don't use incentives to induce good behavior of the objects that they're calling, so we de-emphasize incentives in this picture. Okay, so we start with selection. Hire the best programmers, find good libraries. We spend an extraordinary amount of effort on the inspect phase. Uh, code reviews, static checking tools, etc. And then we arrange to allow the program a certain range of action when it's run. We give it, we give it a set of permissions. And the typical practice is we run the program as the user it's running on behalf of. So anything that user is allowed to do, the program is allowed to do. That's why the square root function in your math library is allowed by your system to delete all of your files. This broad excess of authority invites abuse, creates vulnerabilities. So the, ob the object capability perspective provides an interesting alternative that starts 
by shifting the di static dynamic boundary so that what rights are allowed, what actions are allowed, is decided on a per request basis. And this has a direct analog in our package delivery story. Uh, when I want the package delivery service to deliver a particular package, I just give them that one package. Explain, the request is explained using the language of the API sitting between the principal and agent. This brings us to API design, which we'll come back to later in the talk. Once the agent is reacting, then instrumentation of various sorts uh, can monitor to detect what the agent is doing or has done. And uh, that monitoring can be used for a variety of purposes, including guiding future selection decisions. So the interesting thing about taking all these steps and looking across the world of humans on the left, objects on the right, and in the middle where humans meet objects at user interfaces, is that every cell in this matrix is occupied by interesting activity. Um, but to a shocking extent, each of these cells is examined and studied in isolation. What we want to do is take a look at how these elements interact with each other. And we're going to use the metaphor of an audio mixing board. In an audio mixing board, each slider can be positioned independently of every other slider, but not all settings of the sliders sound good. Which, which setting, a particular setting of one slider will work better with certain settings of the other sliders. So these different slider settings are the different choices available to the principal of how to use these tools in order to um, help shape the agent's behavior. On selection, um, we can go to more open entry, allowing a greater pool of agents to select from, allowing more competition. Or we can go through to more gated, having stricter admission controls so we have better assurance that the agents in our candidate pool have, have um, passed some selection bar. Inspection can range from code review to full machine check verification. Allowing actions can be uh, uh, very broad authority, which is a necessary consequence of allowing the action statically, uh, or very narrow least authority. Least authority is a term in computer security for allowing only the range of actions that the agent needs to satisfy the principal's request and no more. And by narrowing it um, uh, to that limited range, you limit the ability for the agent to, to uh, damage the principal by using uh, um, authority it didn't need. The requests can be explained in a more informal fashion uh, against a uh, backdrop of shared, shared knowledge that's often not written down or it can be much more formally specified in a contract. The reward can range from just providing guidance, like the reward function presented to a machine learning program, or it can, uh, it can be for the purpose of inducing good behavior, such as paying the package delivery company. And monitoring can serve various roles, providing feedback to guide further selection, as we've seen, also detecting various kinds of misbehavior, perhaps preventing damage, or perhaps triggering repair operations. When we examine the package delivery scenario in terms of these settings, this is the settings that seem representative to us. 
the entry is very open. Anybody is able to go into the package delivery service, start a new package delivery business, uh, and I, as a customer, am free to uh, choose any one of them. The authority, as, as we mentioned, is uh, quite narrow. When I want them to, to deliver a, a particular package, I give them just that package and nothing else. Internal software development, as normally practiced in a company, relies heavily on gating. Um, uh, you only take in uh, code from uh, somewhat trusted sources, uh, code written by your internal developers, or code that's somehow vetted. And as a result of depending on that gating, uh, you typically give that code very broad authority um, that creates dangers, but that's but the reason why uh, uh, this, this practice is able to continue is because of the heavy gating on what, on what code is running. Organizational employment is when both principal and agent are employees of the company and we're talking about the, the requests that characterize the internal operation of the company. Again, there's a heavy reliance on gating um, uh, through hiring practices and, um, and the requests are often very informal. There's a, this tremendous background of, of shared knowledge that's never written down and um, uh, the requests um, are often, o often leave many things to the judgment of the various parties. In computer security, um, especially language-based security, the safe plug-in boundary uh, is, a, um, is the boundary, the, the trust boundary between an application that's built to um, uh, accommodate plugins in order for third parties to add value and the third party plugins that would plug into that framework. And the, the framework might like to defend itself against possible misbehavior by the plugins, whether that misbehavior is accidental or, or on purpose. So the entry is very open. That's sort of the whole point of having a plugin interface is to accept third party plugins from anywhere. And in order for these third parties to successfully write plugins that, pl that add value to the application, the interface presented at that boundary has to be rather well specified. Bitcoin and Ethereum present a par particularly interesting example because they push open entry to the, to the extreme. Uh, these are what's known as permissionless systems. Anyone can participate uh, and no one needs to ask anyone's permission and no one can even be evicted for misbehavior. And to cope with the consequences of going to the very extreme on open entry, they go to the opposite extreme on the incentive engineering side, creating this whole architecture of incentives to help shape various behaviors that compose together to create the overall system. However, things don't always go right. Ethereum um, uh, recently had a fairly simple and small contract that had been subjected to code review that once put into play uh, had over $100 million riding on it. And because of a simple bug, money was started to drain out of the system very, very quickly. So to cope with that, they compromised on the open entry. They did what's called a hard fork, which is basically they gated the part of their history in which they lost the money out of existence. And this sort of compromises the entire rationale for why they create systems like this. This was a compromise of a core principle. Instead, going forward, when, there, when a fairly simple piece of code is going to have that much value riding on it, 
we'd like to push the inspection more towards verification um ah so that we can be more confident that there isn't one of these bugs lurking that can cause so much value to drain out. and in order to do so, we also need to push um ah towards more formal specification to do the verification against. ah i'm going to ah break here to just ah check. does the audience have any questions? i i ah wanted this to be more interactive and i went into ah consecutive presentation mode. yeah? Uh, not directly, but but law. Um, let's see. Yeah. So going back to that slide, yeah, law and contracts shows up over here. Uh, this is this slide is really trying to to uh, give a sense of the great variety of disciplines that whose subject matter we're touching on when we do this kind of investigation. Um, and economics, even though they're, they're the principal agent literature has, is trying to span this column, the focus is still on incentives as special. Uh, and in law, there's increasing attention to the ins how the incentives play with the, you know, I interact with the legal structure. Uh, so there's this whole uh, subfield of economics and law, but there's still a surprising degree of separation uh, in how these things are studied. Um, uh, beyond that, I wasn't going to, to speak more specifically of law, but uh, certainly happy to discuss it if you have anything in mind. Yeah? So I've been monitoring. Um, no, you're uh, still, on still on audience time. I'm not trying to rule out ordinary modularity. So, I'm, I, I, I listen to you talking about all of this stuff, and I think about ordinary modularity, and people, modularity people get a little bit nervous. What I, so, so part of um, our message here is that we're not proposing like a whole new programming paradigm. What we're proposing is an analytical framework to better understand why the world as we're practicing it works. Um, uh, modularity, again, is, 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 um, is one element and why software works, why principal and agent compositions uh, uh, tend to behave well and bring about software that, that provides value. Uh, has to do with several of these elements brought together for which modularity plays a huge role um, uh, but it's still within a larger context that's, that's not often analyzed together with it. And in fact, this is a great segue to the next part of the talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, a, a good example of how some of these elements play together is uh, found in uh, Ka Ping Yi's uh, dissertation, Building Reliable Voting Machine Software. And the challenge he set up is one in which we assume that the programmer might wish to bias the election. So neither the programmer nor the code that he writes is trusted. We're assuming that they're an untrusted agent. However, we require him to seem to have followed Tony Hoare's dictum of having written a voting machine that's so simple that it's obviously correct. And in fact, what Ping presented was 400 lines of, 400 lines of very simple code in a simple first order language that could run a voting machine. And 
he provided extensive prose rationale for every single line of code in there and then he subjected this code to extremely intense review by experts and we know from experience that code reviews and security reviews are very effective at spotting accidental bugs and vulnerabilities so the hope was that by going to the extreme on how simple the code was how simple and well characterized the language was in which the code was written uh, how much rationale there was and the intensity um, of the review that the result would be that we could have confidence that we could arrive at a state where we had confidence that the programmer themselves had not in maliciously inserted bugs that could bias the election so to test this what ping did was he purposely inserted three bugs each of which could bias the election and all of which were carefully crafted to evade review and unfortunately he succeeded uh, I was one of the reviewers I failed to catch all the bugs in fact none of the reviewers caught all three bugs one of the bug evaded um, all of the reviewers and would have gone on to bias the election yeah Uh, they were told that there were a number of bugs in there. We were not told how many. And just to make it more dramatic, after several days of reviewing, I think it was two, but Ping's written all this up. You can, you can take a look at his thesis. Uh, but, I, but I'm just going to say, to the best of my memory, after two days where we spotted, I think, maybe one bug, uh, he then, uh, he and David Wagner then told us, all of the bugs are in this hundred lines of code. And it was when we, we narrowed it to those hundred lines of code that we identified two out of the three bugs. Um, uh, 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 as, as mentioned, there was extensive rationale. Uh, they were also there to answer questions. So other than asking them where the bug is, we could ask them all sorts of questions about the rationale and why something worked. Uh, I'll tell you, one of the reasons why I was able to find one bug um, is in reading through the prose rationale, uh, the prose rationale for one of the lines of code seemed right. I didn't spot any flaw with the rationale. It just, the rationale was not written with the same care of writing that as, as the other rationale. And having noticed that, I spent more attention on it and was able to catch the bug. Um, so, um, so I would actually say the first lesson here is that these kinds of empirical investigations is something we're sorely lacking and can be done. I mean, this, this was a valuable experiment. Um, the next lesson is that maliciously inserted bugs, bugs that are crafted to evade review, can do so surprisingly easily. And we've always known that we can craft bugs to evade exhaustive black box testing. The next lesson is that it's much harder to evade detection when review and testing are brought together. Why is this? On the left, we have a piece of code that has an off by one bug. Now, it's this is an oversimplified example, but it's notoriously hard to spot off by one bugs in other people's code. So perhaps this passes review and it looks fine. However, an off by one bug like this will fail on the zero and one case. So even a moderate amount of testing will catch it. The code on the right is crafted to evade detection by exhaustive black box testing. No, no feasible amount of testing will trigger the condition in which uh, uh, that will trigger the trap door. Um, however, when this code is subject to even moderate review, it looks weird. And more realistically, the things that you need to do to craft a bug 
to evade fairly good testing are things that look weirder than the bugs that ping successfully hid in the code. Uh, so, um, uh, so th this is not, um, actually it is backed by, but, um, so yeah, I think formal specification, uh, based on how depressing the outcome was for 400 lines of very simple code and tremendous amount of effort put into review, uh, I would say one of the best killer apps for formal verification is when the programmer is not trusted. Uh, because that's when formal verification gives us the, the, most at, the, the most added value compared to the second best techniques we have available. Um, and uh, later on, I'll be mentioning the SEL4 operating system. And the SEL4 operating system is one that has a full machine check verification of a complex specification. Now, the complex specification might have bugs, but nevertheless, um, we don't need to trust the SEL4 programmers as much as we would have if there was not that formal verification. So I, th I think formal verification, uh, that this, this particular exercise shows that it's very valuable. Yeah, and in fact, verifying the SEL4 verification, I'll guarantee you, is harder than verifying the implementation of this voting machine. Uh, that's a great question. I don't remember, the, the thesis was 2007, so it's been a few years. I don't remember the care with which the specification was stated. Uh, in that ca you know, for the case of the voting machine, we all sort of have uh, common background knowledge of what, what it means for, uh, for, for a machine to be, to be a fair voting machine. Um, uh, and it's a fairly simple criteria. Um, uh, with an operating system kernel, of course, the, what it means to be a correct or even secure operating system kernel is a much more complicated thing to try to specify. Um, uh, uh, that's, that's really all I can say because of, of lost memories. Uh, it's all in the thesis. Um, okay, so what's going on here is that any one of these tools, if stressed, if pushed to solve the entire problem all by itself, um, will often, not always, uh, hit parts of the cost curve that blow up, will we'll hit um, prohibitive parts of the cost curve. But backing off from enough means that it's not enough, it's a compromise. Uh, instead, what we need to recognize is that by bringing these elements to bear jointly, we can still create significant aggregate strength while staying away from the, pro from the prohibitive parts of the cost curves. But this only works if the elements we're bringing together are cross-bracing, if the strengths of one make up for the weaknesses in the other. If they have correlated weaknesses, then their composition is still stronger, but it's much less stronger than we expect. So a few words on how uh, this way of thinking um, 
has helped shape uh, the trade-offs that I've had in mind in bringing proposals to the ECMAScript committee uh, and how that's shaped uh, the evolution of the JavaScript language. I got involved back in the ECMAScript 3 days. Uh, in ECMAScript 3, uh, after ver failures of various sorts, like trying to assign to an unassignable property, uh, the failure would be silent and flow of control would just continue as if nothing bad happened. Um, so this made it impossible to review code for any kind of reliability because one of the most fundamental things in reviewing code is the assumption that forward and control flow assumes success of what just happened. Um, uh, lexical scoping and encapsulation um, uh, were repaired in uh, b both the silent failures and lexical scoping and encapsulation were all repaired going to ECMAScript uh, uh, 5 strict. Uh, in ECMAScript 6, we introduced um, uh, proxies, uh, which gives us the, tr the ability to do transparent intermediation, membranes, what in the uh, PL context is known as contracts. Um, uh, and that gives us the ability to insert instrumentation transparently at all sorts of internal boundaries so we can couple uh, 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 better inspection with, with better testing of assumptions. And we can uh, do, better, do more to monitor compliance at runtime. That's, that's all just applying the PL contracts literature. Um, but ECMAScript 5 strict also introduced an object model that gave us certain stability invariance. And what I mean by that is uh, it, ge it gave the objects a language in which they could promise certain things are stable. And once a certain kinds of stability were promised, the, the, uh, those things could no longer change. So if an object through, that, through the, the property descriptor API says that a particular property is an unassignable is a uh, unmodifiable data property. Um, uh, it could then not change it. And then when we introduce proxies where there might where the proxy synthesizes an object, uh, we constrain the proxies so that they had to uphold the same stability guarantees. Once even a proxy, uh, once making a promise of stability can then uh, not violate it. And the, the really important thing about these stability invariants is that when you're trying to, to use all these tools to understand whether something might go wrong, once you know something stable, you don't have to worry about that element of state getting pulled out from under you later. Uh, give the, the knowing that certain parts of your state are stable gives you tremendous abilities uh, to narrow the things you're worried about. So I just want to, so Ping's thesis, building reliable voting machine software is the one I've been referring to. Adrian Mettler's thesis on the Joe E language, which is an object capability variant of Java. Um, as you can see from the title, a focus of his thesis was on language design to support the review process. Uh, and this was also empirically tested, uh, in this case, more for um, uh, code reviews to, to spot accidental vulnerabilities, but still, uh, still language designed to support the, secure, the security review process. Um, and uh, this one also uh, very much empirically found that stability guarantees by the language uh, were of tremendous aid in uh, helping us narrow our focus of things to worry about in the security review. And then our own paper on the ECMAScript proxies that explain how we can, the proxies can both provide for transparent intermediation uh, while still not being able to violate the stability guarantees that they promise. Okay. Another element, I'm not sorry, another example of how these elements play together can be found in package delivery. And this will again, uh, lead us to some more programming language design lessons. So over here, the box represents 
the space of all possible things the agent might do, the agent being the package delivery service. Every point in that space is a particular thing the agent might do. And sorry, the particular thing the agent is allowed to do. So th yeah, the, spa the space here is, is all the things the agent is allowed to do. Of all the things the agent is allowed to do, the ones in that green circle are the ones that would benefit me. But when I walk up to the counter with the package to be delivered, the ones that I have in mind are for them to deliver the package. And those are the ones that I'm prepared to pay for. So if I give them the package and they deliver it and I pay them, then they win and I win. It's to both of our benefit. But they might cause me harm in various ways. They might damage, lose, or steal the package. Yeah. Yeah. The the outer the outer a green circle. Right. Okay. Uh, so that I would consider that that would, that would benefit me, that's not but you that's right. So, so just to take it, to take a ridiculous other example, um, another thing that's in this circle but not in this circle um, uh, is, um, you know, I just walk up and you know he says, "Would you like your car washed or something?" I mean, just there can be just all sorts of crazy things that he just just decides to do out of the blue that benefits me. It benefits me, but it's not what I had in mind, and it's not what I prepared to pay for. Maybe I pay him for it, in which case it's a benefit to both of us again, but it's not, it's not the thing that I had in mind when I walked up and initiated the relationship. Um, but, but in fact, yes, that's exactly why the outer green circle is so much bigger than the inner green circle. There's this tremendous space of things that I don't have in mind that might be to my benefit anyway. Actually, I'm going to take, a, take another word on that. Um, in economics, when they sort of try to, to explain the sort of the foundations of economics of this double coincidence of I have something you want and you have something I want, the, there's sort of this assumption or, um, that if we have this double coincidence, we'll find each other and we'll trade. But you know, let's say that I walk up to the counter and it turns out that for completely other reasons, not related to the gift at all, I'm, I want to buy a, a car of a particular kind. And it turns out that the agent behind the counter has a car of that kind that he's willing to sell. Well, we probably don't find that out because I encounter him in the context of a, of a structured interaction whose purpose is to bring about package delivery. And these abstractions, these interfaces that businesses create to express the, 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 these, these opportunities to trade is an important contribution that I think computer science has to make to economics is the focus on these abstraction boundaries. These, um, uh, there's an uh, economist, Ludwig Lachmann, who in the 50s uh, wrote about these abstraction boundaries in the economy in ways that are very much reminiscent of the way we think about objects. In any case, so there's various ways the principle can harm me. Um, so the first thing we might think to do as computer scientists is to solve this in a pure computer, sci computer science, computer security manner which is to apply the principle of least authority. The problem here is that the agent was allowed to do any of these things. So if we, apply, if we take the least in the phrase least authority literally, we might try to engineer this situation 
where we say the agent is allowed to deliver my package, but he's not allowed to damage, lose, or steal the package, that any of those actions are illegal. And the problem is that it's not realistic for a package delivery service to operate under conditions in which it's illegal for them to damage or lose the package. The costs of trying to do so would be prohibitive, and if anyone tried, they would have to charge extraordinary prices. So instead, we can bring in a little bit of incentive analysis and recognize that if the agent damages or loses, loses the package, well, they harm me, but they don't particularly benefit or hurt as a result. It doesn't much affect them. On the other hand, the part of this diagram I need to be worried about is when harm to me coincides with benefit to them, where they have an incentive to cause me harm. So if I provide not least authority, but narrow authority, where they're allowed to damage or lose the package, but we prohibit them from stealing the package, an honest package delivery service will not find this remaining prohibition to be a burden. And because the package delivery service does not have an interest in damaging or losing the package, we can solve the remaining alignment problem by use of incentives. However, there will always be the incompetent package delivery service that keeps damaging and loosening packages anyway. So incentives plus allow are not quite adequate. In order for this picture to be coherent, we need a little bit of selectivity, where a package delivery service that keeps damaging or losing packages stops getting selected. OK. This landscape is logically identical to a problem that we face in secure programming language design. When the principal, an object, makes a request of an agent object, the agent object might, be, might carry out the request correctly, in which case everybody wins, or the agent object, let's say, let's take the plugin case, the, the framework is calling the plugin, and then the plugin is reacting. Uh, um, uh, the plug, the, the, if the plugin is written maliciously, um, uh, we can, as usual, divide the attacks the plugin might engage in into av attacks on availability and attacks on, on integrity. But we can recognize that most of the reasons why somebody might decide to write, to write a malicious plugin um, would be because of the opportunity presented by attacking integrity. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine that there's much to be gained by writing a, a malicious plugin that attacks availability. And we can defend integrity <coughs> with conventional language techniques beefed up, like re repairing the encapsulation, so it's really bulletproof encapsulation. Um, uh, whereas preventing availability attacks, such as the agent, the plugin going into an infinite loop, it's a very hard thing to engineer programming language defenses for that. And once again, this picture, there will always be uh, someone who finds that, it, that, that they find it in their interest to attack availability, whether for bragging rights or fun. So again, this picture only makes sense when coupled with a little bit of selectivity, a plugin that repeatedly just wedges its framework by coming into an infinite loop will just stop getting plugged in. So the lesson here is that we need to consider the overall structural integrity that we get from bringing all of these elements together to bear on the problem. It's not, not even adequate to just look at them crosswise. Um, we need to look at the, the, the overall strength 
of the system as all of these pieces play together. Not just the struts here, but also the, the furniture as a whole. So attacks on integrity are attacks by way of effects, of causing effects. So to use narrow, to use narrow authority to, de to defend against attacks on, on integrity, uh, we want to limit effects. So we first can think about limiting effects, so to speak, in space. Uh, we started with memory unsafe imperative languages like assembly language and then C and C++ in which there's no disallowing of actions at all. It's completely permissive. Anybody can affect any piece of state. At the other extreme, there's pure functional programming um, in which there are no effects at all. Um, and when you're programming in a pure, using a purely functional language to program in a purely functional manner, uh, that can be a great boon to, to local reasoning. But we're dealing with the stateful world. We often need to model state. So by the time you've modeled state, you're operating a different level of abstraction. Um, so we need to still worry about how we model state. So the, the next less permissive after memory unsafe languages are, are memory safe languages like Java and JavaScript. And I'm going to claim that there's a sweet spot with object capabilities. Uh, that object capabilities give us a, uh, still give us a stateful, wor stateful world in which we can direct directly model state using state, uh, but they enable us to reason about locality by reasoning about isolation of the subgraph. Um, that uh, an isolated subgraph is confined and cannot cause any effects outside of itself, including not being able to cause any IO to the external world. There's also isolating effects in time. Um, the, the confusions caused by interleaving of effects. So we started here in sequential programming, which is very safe against interleaving, uh, gave us some good, a good st starting point for reasoning about um, uh, the sequence of effects in time. Uh, but we live in a concurrent world and we needed to deal with concurrency. So the next step we took was preemptive multi-threading, which as we know is a nightmare to reason about in which um, uh, the interleaving of effects in time was completely permissive. Uh, any effect could, could pretty much happen at any time. The next less permissive thing is cooperative multithreading. And cooperative multithreading uh, is, uh, has a problem which directly relates to the principal agent view of coordination, um, which is if the agent yields, his calling principle has been suspended and his, calling, and his principal's principle has been suspended and they might not know they have been suspended. And while that stack of principles is suspended, other interleavings happen, disrupting their assumptions. So the only, one, the, the only entity that knew that they were at a yield point was the, was the agent that yielded, not the call chain above it. So the sweet spot here, uh, I would say, is communicating event loops, where each turn runs to completion uh, before the next one happens. Let's see. I think I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, I'll just say a few words in this, about this slide. There are techniques for defending availability. Uh, they're important, um, but uh, they're not an incremental step uh, from most programming languages. And JavaScript is certainly a language from which you cannot incrementally get to where you could defend availability at fine grain. 
and the previous analysis shows we don't we don't really need to for many of our security goals. Yeah. So, so the actor model, uh, so fine grain actors, um, uh, the, the is in some sense pure communicating event loops, which ev every actor event is a turn of the event loop, and every message is an asynchronous message causing a new turn. Uh, and what that means is that you have to do the full asynchronous reasoning all the way down to the finest grain manipulation of state. So that has a different burden. Uh, the thing about communicating event loops is um, you've got uh, both the sequential call, call return and the asynchronous message passing. Uh, and and um, I'm going to, to um, uh, so the thing about those two constructs is that each of them has a very strong contract that enables the programmer to reason about what they need to worry about regarding state change. With the immediate call, and they have, they have opposite pros and cons. With the immediate call, the caller knows that um, no time passes between making the call and the callee receiving the request, that nothing else happens between those two things. Um, uh, but the downside is that the call, while something is on the stack, it is often suspends invariance. So the caller might have various invariants suspended. The callee, by composition, might accidentally reach back into the caller while the caller's invariants are suspended, causing plan interference hazards. So uh, the caller is endangered by the callee, and the callee, because it's starting not in an empty stack state, is endangered by the caller. Asynchronous message passing in a communicating event loop system has exactly the opposite pros and cons. Um, uh, you've got the pro that the current turn runs to completion without the callee running at all, that the callee is postponed to a completely separate turn, and the callee knows that he's starting from an empty stack, so presumably everybody's invariants have been restored by the time the callee starts. But on the other hand, between making the request and responding to the request, there's an arbitrary number of other interleavings which can have mutated states. So presumably invariants are restored, but the stateful assumptions are very different than the situation in which the call was made. Um, uh, and only communicating event loops, is, as far as I know, has those two forms of invocation with those corresponding strengths and weaknesses in reasoning about state. So ECMAScript 3 was actually a very good starting point with regard to some of these considerations. I, I especially want Gilad to hear that. ECMAScript 3 was a surprisingly good starting point for some of these considerations. Um, uh, it's already, of course, memory safe. In ECMAScript 3, you almost had lexical scoping. You almost had encapsulation. Um, but uniquely among languages, it had um, or almost uniquely among languages. It, it started uh, among legacy languages that were in large-scale use. It had an almost perfect separation that's analogous to the operating system separation between user mode and system mode. There's the language itself, as, as standardized by the ECMAScript committee, which is almost purely just computational, completely free of I.O. Uh, and then the ECMAScript language provides a hook, host object, by which hosts, like a browser or a Node.js server, make IO services available. And those services are therefore avail available via a distinct set of objects. So the objects that provide for computation and the objects pr that provide for IO ha are really very much split uh, one from the other. Um, uh, and uh, that, that makes it a very good starting point to build a object capability system from. Uh, another thing is that 
uh, JavaScript uh, always had multiple realms, multiple isolated object graphs in the browser by virtue of same origin iframes. Every time you create a new iframe, you create a completely new world of objects that's disconnected from any previous such world. Uh, this was not officially part of the standard until ECMAScript 6, but the multiple realms is now is part of the standard in ECMAScript 6. Uh, and JavaScript has always been in the communicating event loop model. So what we needed to do was basically just amplify these virtues going forward um, in order to get good support for object capabilities, uh, in order to go somewhat beyond object capabilities for local reasoning, um, uh, such as uh, further amplifying the communicating event loops model uh, with promises and async functions. And this gives us uh, good abilities to reason about limits on effects both in time and in space. Let's talk about the division of labor, which is really the division and composition of knowledge. And this brings us to API design. In API design, uh, the API is the, is the language that the principal and agent have to have in common so the principal can make requests that the agent can know how to respond to. And those requests can be at the more informal end of the spectrum, such as a parser that just open codes the pushing of a token in terms of an underlying array, or if I know that, that you are going to happen to see my dad tomorrow, I might just give you the package and say, could you please drop this off with my dad when you see him? Or it can be at the more formal end of the spectrum, where we, where we, co we coin new concepts, such as stack and package delivery service. And the big advantage of more, formal, more formally specified interfaces, more explicit interfaces, is it allows a multiplicity. It allows multiple means by which the interface can be implemented, multiple means by which these requests can be, brought, can be satisfied, and it allows principles to, to, to make the requests for a great multiplicity of reasons. Um, uh, when the interface abstracts over a multiplicity of means, we call that polymorphism. When the interface abstracts over the multiplicity of purposes, we call that reuse. And when the interface abstracts over both sides, we call it an abstraction boundary. So as we've been doing this work, we've been noticing some patterns reappear as we examine one scenario after another and try to set sliders that represent our understanding of what's going on in that scenario. So over here, the left column represents the human world and the right column is the object world. Um, the first row are scenarios that rely uh, heavily on gating um, uh, strict admission controls into the inter, um, uh, as to what the entities are that are interacting. The dominant shape of the network is a hierarchy, what uh, Herb Simon called almost hierarchical systems. Because of the heavy reliance on gating, the agents are very trusting of each other, which is to say they're very vulnerable to each other. Um, the relationships are often very informal against a large background of shared knowledge that's never written down. And they're often one-to-one. Uh, -one, and being informal and one-to-one, -one, we would say that they're very concrete relationships. On the lower left, we have the package delivery business, or more generally, uh, any business on the open market uh, in which uh, you have completely open entry. Anybody can go into the package delivery business and anybody can select any package delivery um, uh, service. Um, the result of the open entry is that 
every entity, every principal and agent has to defend themselves, has to be wary of the other entities they're interacting with and defend themselves against their possible misbehavior. The interfaces are more specified and accommodate multiplicity on both sides. Uh, uh, both uh, uh, competitive supply among agents and competitive demand among principles and being more specified and many to many we would say that they're abstract. And what we find in the computer security work such as the safe plugin boundary is it has many of the characteristics in common with the um, uh, with the uh, businesses on, th on the network. And the most important characteristic is that these are very decentralized networks. They have much less of a hierarchical flavor than the first uh, set of patterns. So, in summary, we're already in a world of mixed networks of humans and objects making requests of each other. These networks are shifting and changing rapidly over time and which roles are, pl are filled by humans versus objects shift and changes over time. So we need to transcend those, the differences between humans and objects and thinking about their dynamics. These systems of request making are powerful because of the division of knowledge that's uh, enabled by the information hiding, but the information hiding comes with hazards. So we need to reason both about how to, um, how to divide knowledge successfully and how to overcome those hazards. We need to reason about the composition of these compromises that um, we need to reason about what kind of aggregate strength comes from composing these compromises. Uh, the situation we're in right now is, is you know, just using the analogy suggested by that diagram, it's as if we have material science without structural engineering. We can reason it very well about how strong this I-beam beam is or how flexible that wood panel is, but we don't really examine, other than by unstated intuition, how strong the house is when you, build, when you put all these elements together into a structure. And what happens when we compose these compromises, how they um, reinforce each other or not, is worthy of study. And we need to understand better the emergent properties of networks of, of request making entities, uh, what the emergent properties are both when things go right and when things go wrong. When things go right, we want to, to maximize the benefits that follow from cooperation. And when things go wrong, we want to minimize the damage. Two minutes over time? Okay. Yeah, Elka? No? Yeah. So I can sort of see how this analysis is beneficial to people like us and PS or whatever. Uh, what response have you gotten lately for your co-op? Uh, what are they going to think about this? Uh, not much yet. <laughs> we kind of hope to change that. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, Well, Bill and I have been discussing, actually, how we expect the economics, you know, economists to react to this. So maybe you could discuss some of what we've been discussing about the expected reaction. Well, actually, one of the things that relates to your earlier question was you were saying, like, what group of economists would we approach with this? So, the, so there's this sort of, you know, it's a broad field. There's a different 
branch of economics is something called institutional economics, which tries to bring in the law and, and institutions and how they impact that. And when I look at that, they're also dealing with principal agent problems, but um, trying to bring in, they share the same notion that we're talking about as there's multiple approaches to solving a principal agent problem, not just you know manipulating the utility function on the other side. And so I think that is where we hope to have greater impact. Um, finding that within that group, people who also know enough um, of the computer science to relate to it is, is a challenge we're, we're running into. Yeah, I've also, um, yeah, the, the, the problem with interdisciplinary work uh, is that people are too quick to disqualify themselves from being interested because they don't feel like, you know, there are very few people who feel like they know both disciplines well. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that we're trying to, to we believe and that, that you don't need to know both disciplines well in order to benefit from this framework. That, um, and that's true on both sides, we believe. Um, uh, Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if uh, I mean if you consider opposing objects on one side and then human on the other side, the spatial character is defining the maybe total level of abstraction that make it more attractive to read about book as a research that you are conducting. Or you are satisfied with the belong to the other system. Uh so um uh since I saw your 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 talk, uh, the 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 talk that just preceded uh, this one, um, I suspect I know what kind of higher level abstractions you have in mind. <laughs> Not necessarily those, uh, but yes, uh, certainly. I mean. So, so I think the way I would answer that is, first of all, yes. But um, more specifically, over here, this is a particular split between the static world of design and development and the dynamic world of runtime. And overall, this whole analysis framework, we're very much thinking in terms of purposes, uh, what, the, you know, what the principles want and what the agent wants and what they're trying to bring about and what, and what accidents they make and all that. We're taking a very intentional terminology and, and set of concepts in thinking about uh, principal-agent relationships. Um, uh, the, uh, some of the uh, work that you might have in mind um, would preserve that terminology, but move more of the reasoning about purposes into the dynamic world. Uh, right, right now, all of the reasoning about the purposes are the humans reasoning about what the objects do rather than the objects reasoning about their purposes. And different ways of constructing software will have different boundaries between the static and dynamic. The, the, reason I, the reason I bring this up is I, is I, 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 I actually made a deal for a car in a, um, uh, in, in a co coincidental uh, commercial encounter about something else. So how does that happen in the software world? So I, 
Ah. Ah, ah. Ooh. So my, my static dynamics play here is, is very conservative. So what I'm trying to do is um, really describe mainstream programming pr practice and try to account for why it works. Um, and a lot of the things that you're thinking of, again, can be characterized within this framework, but with much more of it happening at runtime among the objects. Um, uh, but I think that this discovery of accidental synergies, this accidental discovery rather, um, uh, uh, I don't know of systems that have successfully brought that about realistically at runtime purely among software. But, but maybe I just don't happen to know of good examples. Yeah. Um, so that brings up another thing, which is that 400 lines of code. Yeah. Uh, simple code in simple language. Sounds like one of the conclusions was the definition of simple was wrong. That actually that language and the lines of code are actually quite hard. Well, and you proved it yourself by failing to understand it. Right. So, so simple is a relative term. It's like, you know, is, is an ant tall or not? Um, uh, it's certainly simple. It's it's uh, simple compared to pretty much any, any other program I've encountered that people have have seriously tried to examine to figure out what it means. Uh, certainly, it's 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 you know orders of magnitude simpler than the voting machines that critical elections depend on. Um, uh, so it's so what I would say is it's best case. It's much, much simpler than anybody imagined before Peng did his work you could do to create a realistic voting machine. Uh, and nevertheless, what we found by this testing, uh, by, 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 by purposely inserting bugs that were, that were built to evade detection but still biased the election, is yes, that, that 400 simple lines of code in a first order language um, uh, is much harder than we expected going into it, um, and much harder uh, than um, uh, we should be comfortable with as we build critical systems from people that we don't, you know, from people that we don't necessarily trust. So, with the fact that it was a first-order language, do you think that makes things simpler or more comfortable? Uh, I can say I, I can say very specifically in the case of the voting machine software that we examined, it made things simpler. Uh, there were no problems that were in, in, that, in that software, there were no problems that were expressed in a more roundabout manner because of the lack of any higher order constructs. Uh, now that will differ from case to case, but that was the case with the voting machine. Wow. So the off the top of my head answer is no, but um, so that's the first thing that I found that we have that they don't have. Everything else. Yeah. Works. So um, 
uh, yeah, and, th and this is, by the way, reflected in, um, let's actually go to the aggregate diagram here. So um, one of the things uh, to notice here um, is that uh, in the human world, the inspect dimension is fairly weak. Um, uh, it's completely absent. Um, yeah, um, the examples that we found for uh, inspection, which is you know, where, the, where the formal verification would come in, uh, in the human world are things like uh, accounting controls. Um, uh, when you, uh, uh, you know, build a corporation and you do some things like separate front office and back office, uh, what you've done is you've ensured that certain kinds of misbehavior can't happen unless there's a conspiracy of at least two people. Um, and it turns out that, you know, it doesn't, that doesn't sound like a great burden to have a conspiracy of two, but it turns out to be tremendously valuable to have raised the stakes that high. Um, uh, but that's just uh, you know, making use of inspect. It, I wouldn't say it's anything like formal verification. Um, yeah, the problem when you have a system built from human beings is what do you verify? What you can do is you can create some great simplification. Basically, you can do what we did in software before the SEL4 operating system, which is, we would not prove an implementation correct. We would make some abstract model of the implementation, and then we would prove that that abstract model of the implementation satisfied the specification. But the actual implementation, who knew? So you could do the same thing with package delivery service, but the discrepancy between your model and the subject matter will be even greater. I think the main thing that, that we do have to contribute to economics uh, uh, is, uh, well, two things. One, we're giving them a whole new world to apply their principal agent analysis to, and we've provided them the bridge of what the particulars are in carrying over their framework. And the other thing that we're uh, supplying, and this is actually a, an earlier paper by Bill and I in the economics literature, um, is uh, the programming language literature about abstraction boundaries uh, really brings in, we think, an important new tool for understanding what's going on in an economy as concepts like a package delivery service are formed and change over time. With programs, we refactor from outside the system. With the economy, the refactoring, the discovery of these abstraction boundaries has to be done dynamically from within the system, from among the objects that are participating. And I think going back and forth over those two views of what an abstraction boundary is, I think we both have a lot to learn from each other. Sorry? Do you get a better response from the equipages? Uh, 